Perfect. So we are ready to go. All right. So um, just to begin, I'd like to uh, acknowledge the land on which I live in Ottawa is the traditional unceded and never surrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. And the Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I'm grateful to have the opportunity to be present uh, on this territory. So I encourage everyone, if they don't know already, to visit nativeland.ca to find out whose land on which they live as part of um, their ongoing commitments to um, the calls to action in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So in this webinar, I'll be giving sort of a crash course on doing advocacy and why it's important. And then uh, I'll discuss a specific CFEW campaign on early learning and childcare that we undertook this past fall. Then I'll provide you with just a brief overview on CFEW's upcoming advocacy goals on the 16 days of activism campaign. And then after that, I'll review the structure and I hope um, Catherine and Jeanette can help me out on this as well, um, of the uh, who does what uh, advocacy guidelines. So this is the structure by which uh, CFUW club members, presidents, regional directors, etc., should abide when engaging in advocacy initiatives on behalf of CFUW. And lastly, we will have a Q&A type of um, session where we can discuss any outstanding questions or concerns. Um, and hopefully Catherine, myself, and Jeanette, and we will be able to provide you with some clarity on that. So um, to begin, let's start with a general question. So in the chat, I'd like you to write three words or less if you're feeling ambitious um, that you feel describes the current status of women and girls in Canada or around the world in the COVID-19 context. So I'll get my chat up. Let's see what you have to say. Three words or less. Going backwards, vulnerable, stress, anxious, just there, fragile, at risk, stressful, at risk, disempowered, more abuse, lots of work to be done, at risk, didn't lose their jobs, isolated, stress, threatened, threatened, losing ground. Vulnerable, stress. Stressed, disadvantaged. Rolling back progress. Anxious, more work, worried, stressed, threatened, vulnerable. Um, yeah, so if, if you can see uh, all of these responses rolling in, um, sort of some negative and anxious connotations going on. So, I mean, as many of you know and have stated, the COVID-19 pandemic has, you know, disproportionately and uniquely impacted women and girls from the she session to um, record levels of, of women's unemployment to the lack of uh, high quality affordable childcare or increased levels of gender-based violence. So this just shows how perilous the situation is for um, the rights of women and girls in Canada and um, why now is the time where we need to raise our voices and advocate for what's right. I hope, um, there we go. So now for a crash course on advocacy and I'm going to make everyone smaller so you can see the entire thing. So why do we engage in advocacy? When we take action on something we believe in, we can increase awareness about the topic, um, convene and bring together like-minded individuals and groups in our community to affect change. We can demand accountability from our elected officials and decision makers to represent our interests. Uh, that represent our interests, we help to strengthen the voices of impacted individuals or groups who may have been marginalized from important conversations, and we help build the capacity of 
not only our organization, but civil society's capacity in general to take meaningful action to affect change. So again, with our, our chat function, um, your experiences as a CFUW member, in what ways have you engaged in advocacy in the past? I'll go back to my chat. Public forums. Letter writing, marches, picketing, briefs, marches, consultations. Letter writing in those marches. I'm seeing, I hopefully everyone can see my um, screen with the uh, chat. You have you have disabled the, the chat room? I've disabled the chat. I wonder, people are writing in. Is anyone else having that problem? No, I can see all the chats. other like-minded bodies sure so it disappeared mm -mm -mm. possibly it's it's something that has to do with um moving your mouse or something i'm unsure who, who that was uh, as i don't have anyone up uh judy if you look at charlotte's picture uh and go with your mouse onto her picture and to the upper right hand corner, there's a little blue box that's got three dots on it. Click on that box and you'll see the word chat appear. And you should get the chat box below the picture of Charlotte. Does that help? Thanks, Heather. Oh, okay, sir. All set, Judy? All right, well, um, I'm just going to move on. Uh, not a huge deal if you can't uh, access the chat, just I'm trying to just generate some conversation. So uh, for CFBW, our work uh, seeks to end inequalities and injustices for women and girls in Canada and around the world by advancing their rights. So, um, with policies that range from um, climate change to long-term care to gender-based violence, there are myriad issues and opportunities for engagement on something that you care about. So um, engaging uh, in advocacy on CFEW policies provides meaningful opportunities for members and other like-minded groups to capture the attention of their community policymakers and civic leaders. So as we can see from the answers in the chat, advocacy can take many forms. So no one action is sufficient on its own, nor is one necessarily better than another. So as different windows of opportunity open up, depending on the current political climate, there are a variety of actions you can take to get your message across. So if we look at this advocacy impact spectrum, um, this is, was created by a grassroots nuclear disarmament group called Beyond the Bomb. And if you know me, you know I'm a, a staunch advocate of nuclear disarmament. Um, so as we move along the, the spectrum from left to right, um, we can see that there are varying levels of engagement at each stage. So the awareness side of the spectrum could include reading a post or infographic on social media. Next, engagement could look like signing a petition or sharing a, a post to reach more people in your networks. Uh, catalytic actions, so the blue sections, um, could be writing a letter to the editor or op-ed in your newspaper, joining a protest, a rally, I love protests, um, calling or writing your elected official about concerns on the topic. And this could be sending a letter in the mail or um, sending an email, and both of which are, are equally effective and are given the same weight um, at politicians' offices. Um, lastly, we have uh, direct lobbying. So this means nowadays scheduling a virtual meeting with an elected official. 
um, to urge them to vote a certain way on upcoming legislation. So this is the most targeted type of advocacy wherein expert advocates are drawing on established blueprints or frameworks that have specifically specific policy options um, or asks attempting to sway elected officials to support certain legislation. So for CFUW advocacy specifically, as an example, let's use our work on childcare. So CFUW has long advocated for high quality early learning and childcare. And um, these are just a few examples of the different initiatives we undertook this fall. So here we have a letter that Catherine wrote to the prime minister, deputy prime minister, leaders of major parties, uh, various ministers uh, of interest and uh, critics while parliament was prorogued. So that was an opportune time to advocate as this was the time where the government um, was figuring out what will be on their agenda and who, which parties are going to support it. So this is what my sent out box looks like after circulating the letter that, um, that Catherine sent. Uh, lots, of, lots of targeted officials there. And uh, next, another example is uh, I created um, a, uh, I use an online letter writing tool called Action Network that allowed anyone to send a letter to the four ministers uh, and express support for a national child care program, not only CFPW members, but just anyone in the uh, Canadian public. And uh, immediately following the throne speech in September, where the government stated that they would commit to significant long term investments in a Canada wide early learning and child care program. And they use CFUW terminology, um, just they, they definitely lifted that from our letter. Um, CFUW released this social media post and it garnered significant levels of engagement and it actually remains one of our most uh, engaged with posts to date. Um, and lastly, after all of this, uh, all of these different initiatives, Catherine and myself actually had the opportunity to have a meeting with um, MP Lindsay Matheson about CFUW's call for affordable, accessible, high quality childcare. And it was a productive meeting where we discussed the MP's position on childcare and effective strategies going forward in our advocacy work on childcare. And um, that included nailing down the wording of our asks, so universal versus national. And uh, we also discussed the importance of following through on the government's 2018 commitments to the Indigenous uh, Early Learning and Child Care Framework. So these are all examples that yourself or your club may endeavor to do um, with an advocacy initiative that you care about. And again, no one action is better than another, nor are they sufficient on their own. So it's really the amalgamation of everything that works together to, towards one goal. So, in this case, on the child care uh, advocacy case, CFUW followed this loose framework for our advocacy on early learning and child care. Obviously, we wanted to address a topic that we have observed is in need of change or a new approach. And in this case, um, the, the issue was the COVID pandemic has exacerbated a long standing crisis in Canadian childcare and really showed the urgent need for a Canada wide childcare program that is accessible, affordable and high quality. So next, our desired objective is was the creation of such a program and to broaden support. To broaden support, um, we thought about why we cared about early learning in childcare and why others might care too, and integrated that into our approach. So um, the government's uh, commitments to gender equality, um, the success of Quebec's child care program, how shutting down essential early learning and child care services impacted the ability of Canadian parents to either return to work or work productively in the absence of these services. And lastly, how our, how our proposal would be beneficial for children's development, early learning and child care workers, workers, um, who are parents of children and just the broader impacts of such a program to the lagging uh, post COVID, during COVID Canadian economy. And second to last, we presented a 
comprehensive and evidence-based solution for the pathway forward by drawing on um, our partner Child Care Now's framework called the Affordable Child Care for All Plan. So we included a comprehensive and heavily researched plan from our partners. And by doing that, we effectively expanded the reach and capacity of Child Care Network's um, research that they already undertook. So it all didn't fall to CFUW to do this work. Um, information sharing with partners allows us for allows our efforts to be consolidated and more effective and not duplicated or watered down. So utilizing the established expert in the area of interest re-legitimizes them as the expert and ultimately helps push forward a common goal. So in our lastly, in our meeting with um, MP Matheson, we were able to reevaluate the frame of our ask. So the frame is the words and stories and goals that we include and um, in, in our action ask. So these are very important, these words, these stories, because um, it significantly impacts the recipient or the listener's likelihood of supporting it. So in this case, um, we discussed with NP Matheson that um, a national childcare program has a completely different connotation, connotation to a politician than the words Canada-wide child care program or universal child care program. So again, we took that into consideration and uh, reevaluated our approach. So um, that is just an example of some of the work we've been undertaking. And, and here are some upcoming uh, events and campaigns. So, um, as you know, uh, CFUW uh, partakes in the annual 16 Days of Activism Against Gender-Based Violence campaign. So um, for 2020, I have created a toolkit that includes up-to-date information about gender-based violence in the context of COVID, uh, gun violence, Indigenous women and girls, and uh, gender-based violence on Canadian campuses and the ways you can take action. And that package, along with some shareable social media posts and printable posters, will be available this week. And as many clubs across Canada would normally plan vigils for the December 6th anniversary, we're currently exploring some alternatives to this important event. So on a similar note, there are many opportunities to engage with CFBW during the 16 days campaign. So, it is the 50th anniversary of the Royal Commission on the Status of Women, which was, I found out today, was an idea that was credited to past CFUW President Laura Sabia. Um, and we will also be holding a, a day of action against gender-based violence on December 7th, where we'll, we will be advocating for a national action plan on gender-based violence. So stay tuned on um, our COVID-friendly action proposals. Uh, this will most likely look like dropping off a letter at your local MP's office. Um, and we will also be having a, a CFU, CFUW wide movie screening of the newly released film Women, which is an award winning documentary that examines the state of womanhood across the world. So um, you might be asking now, great Charlotte, Thanks for all of that information, but now how can I engage as a CFUW member? And this is where we, um, where we hope to clarify some um, questions and concerns that have been uh, occurring with um, who specifically CFUW members can contact. So as I have uh, up on the screen, you can see um, uh, our, um, great uh, advocacy uh, you know point person Terry Shaw has created this chart um, to demonstrate which uh, level of CFUW uh, advocates to whom so um, I hope we can um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and then we'll be able to um, have more discussion on this on this topic and uh, this is where we, we will begin some uh, Q&A and hopefully uh, Jeanette, Catherine, or myself can answer some questions. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen now. Um, and if possible, I could, I could actually bring this up um, again. 
but uh, let's get everyone back. And I do have some chats. I can get print to the PowerPoint. Sure. Here. All right. So um, I'm wondering now if you would like to type some questions into the chat function or um, we can use the, the hand raise um, function to ask questions. I'm, I'm actually going to share my screen again um, just to get the, the chart back up if possible. So I'm not sure if um, Catherine or Jeanette would like to talk about just some of the concerns that members have been having um, over the, the advocacy guidelines or if anyone has any questions. So I can I'm speak. Jeanette, take that one away. Mm -hmm. I, I, I yeah. can speak about a question that came about who uh, we can uh, CC if we send a letter to our local MP or MPP uh, or MLA, uh, can we CC the opposition uh, and or the minister in charge of that particular uh, topic? And yesterday we had a good discussion in our uh, uh, advocacy committee meeting and we decided that we would say uh, yes, we can do some of those things. And if you look down uh, at the very bottom to local clubs, you'll see that uh, what we have said about uh, letters from local clubs signed by the club president, the signature can be held by the advocacy chair or a designated representative so that the president doesn't have to uh, physically sign each letter but it has to be on the club letterhead and CC'd to the club president. Now that letter has to go to your local member of parliament, uh, including uh, if your member is the prime minister or a minister, if they're your local uh, representative, you, you, your club can be in touch with them. The local member of provincial legislature, including if your member is a premier or a minister, and any jurisdiction of issue to local reps only. And then you can CC to relevant ministers. So that means if your uh, uh, MP is the Minister of Health, or you have something that you want to write about, uh, for example, with long-term care, and you want it to go to your, it has to go to your local member, but you also want the Minister of Health to know about it, then you can CC that person. And that's been something that uh, has been a real problem because we haven't had any uh, sort of regulation about it. And people would uh, ask quietly, can we do it? Well, I've been doing it uh, without, uh, you know, knowing whether it's approved or not. Now we're saying, let's try this. Let's see how it works. And, uh, see if that solves some of the problems that the local um, uh, clubs are having wanting to go forward further with their advocacy. Can I just add that, oh, don't take that away. Oh, sorry. No, just leave it up and put it, put it full screen if you can. Can I just add that uh, yesterday when we talked about this form, um, we talked about uh, letters and emails. Oh, right. <laughs> that letters and emails may be written asking for information and letters and emails can be signed by the national president uh, and signed by the council president and signed by the club president so that they don't have to be paper emails or paper letters. They can be emails. Emails are the de rigueur at these days for sending uh, information and um, urging letters 
to premiers, prime ministers, and local members of parliament. Sending by mail is not the usual way to go anymore. So, right. thank you, Heather, for pointing that out. Sorry, I didn't uh, bring that up. You want to address also the issue of if a club has. Um, something that's a local concern, but in fact it has provincial or national implications to contact national office. And we can actually then write letters and send letters to the clubs asking them to do their own advocacy in their areas. So I'm thinking the example that, you, that we had yesterday of the coal mining, was it in... Um, in Blairmore, oh, Alberta. Or is it in yeah. BC? No, it's in Alberta. Thank you. And, and, yeah. And so that was a, an issue to the local club, but actually it's an issue that's beyond that. So we were saying that if you, if you contact your provincial VP, then you can take it to the provincial level. And last week we had the example of the Micmac fishermen and uh, Southport was working on campaign and they contacted national and we've now sent letters out to the ministers and to the the prime minister and what have you so we've taken it a step further for southport i think you have some questions in the chat charlotte yeah and just on that note um yes. we can see right uh here that if like for example with the Mi'kmaq fishers um if if an issue pertains to the the national initiatives that that is a a way to to elevate it and get um a letter signed by by catherine to uh the prime minister and, and various ministers so um we have here, hold on. Is it okay if I take this away? Um, what are the questions? <laughs> yes, we have a few questions. Let me get the chat. Hold on. They're, they're not uh, particularly on this chart, but just in case questions do come up because people are probably still squinting at it. Hold on. Here we go. So we have, um, what policy is that? We have um, Janet Watson's question Janet about Watson, resolution why process. Why does the resolution, I'll just read it. Why does the resolution process take so long? Intents need to be submitted by November 15, but they are not voted on until June. Is there any way to reduce the red tape? An issue may change drastically between November and June. Good question. I don't have anyone on the call that's chaired the resolutions process, I don't think. Yes, yeah, is Grace But the here? intent, is Grace on? I thought she might be, but anyway. So I think that the, the, you have the intent, and then that's to let you know the resolution's coming, and then you have the resolution. But if you're going to give clubs time to... Uh, examine the resolution and propose amendments, you have to allow for the fact that the clubs have to meet. So I know from, from being on the resolutions committee in my own club, um, or the, it was the issues group, but you know, we would be looking at our timetable from January to March to make sure we had time to do our own research, to decide what we supported, if we saw um, a need for an amendment, and then we'd have to take it to our club. But we do have, like as we had this year, two emergency resolutions that came in um, late in the year. So there is, I think, an opportunity for um, keeping things current. Yeah, good question. Uh, I could answer that because I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a past director of resolutions. And when you, when you formulate a resolution, you want to formulate one that will apply for a long time. So you, you want it to be quite broad. And you also need to do a lot of research. 
And I think all that is very time consuming. Anyone who's ever uh, written a resolution proposal <laughs> will know how much time it takes. And then it has to go to all the clubs and then it has to come back again. And then people make comments and then and there are amendments possible. It's a very solid process and it, present, and it results in excellent resolutions uh, that we then use in advocacy. It's kind of a cycle. So I think if you're trying to do a resolution and things are so drastically changed in three months that it's no longer applicable, it probably wasn't a good resolution proposal to begin with because it would address only a very specific time limited question. One of the things that we uh, uh, have had a lot of work on this year from two of our members, Margaret Terry and, and Terry Shaw, who are a subcommittee on uh, reviewing our policies, is that they have gone through all of our policies since 1964 and have uh, uh, taken out all of the uh, resolutions or the policies, pardon me, uh, that uh, are still active today. And they have put them into a separate document, which uh, I believe has been posted on the member's website. Yes. Or if not, it will be very soon. And that gives you um, a very quick reference as to uh, what um, issues are um, supported by our policies. And you can check to see if uh, what you are wanting to talk about is already a policy. Many of the policies have been from 1964 on, and some of them need to be updated, but others are still very, very current. And uh, you can refer to them when you are working on an issue. Um, there was a question about the policy that was attached to the Indigenous uh, fisheries issue. And I would say that uh, if we checked our Indigenous policies, there would be something there to support that. It is the, the, the newest policy for the 2020 year on the calls to action, the 94 calls to action um, on the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. So I believe it was called the action number 52 and another one um, to, to um, strengthen and uh, uphold the treaty rights of uh, Indigenous peoples. Right. Thank you. Also, um, having time for the clubs to go through the amendments is really good because you get a lot of feedback and from that you can often uh, narrow down your resolution or make it more um, just more secure or more direct. And, and I, that's, that's a big help to the club who is writing a resolution as well to get that kind of feedback. It usually results in an improved resolution yeah. because yeah. there are clubs across the country that have concerns or have experience with that issue who will write that in. And uh, that is reflected then in the amended version that ultimately gets pre presented at the AGM. Yeah. And it makes the AGM process go a lot quicker and a lot smoother than it used to years ago because we've had time to refine all the amendments and that years ago that used to be done on the floor at the AGM and so it took a lot of time but now that a lot of that is is taken care of beforehand so that makes it for a smoother process as well. Well we were very uh, uh, lucky this year to have eight, eight resolutions uh, uh, accepted and uh, have become policy in this one year. It's uh, quite an amazing uh, event actually i don't think i have seen that many uh, resolutions brought forward and passed ever before i, I have to disagree with you there jeanette because okay. we used to we used to have years where we had 15 or 16 and the, the complaint was always there way too many and then oh. i think last year we had none which was the first time that ever happened and mm -hmm. i think we are seeing a reaction by more clubs sending them in this year ah okay Sorry about that. that. I guess that was before my time <laughs> in CFDW. Yeah. Yeah, do you want to talk about the fact as well, um, when, when you know that the fact that we have these backgrounders 
that are really useful information if you're setting up a meeting or you're writing a letter to to use the back to use the background background as that have been produced to go with the resolutions in the advocacy package the advocacy four pack the full advocacy package there you go right um there was another question on um just uh, the availability of the PowerPoint and I, yes, I will be uploading that as, as well uh, with the recording. Um, Heather has a question about questions. Are there any other questions? Ah. Just prompting. I didn't get my question answered about participating in pre-budget hearings. Uh, oh. like our, our club gets invited personally uh, annually to submit um, proposals or briefs uh, to these hearings. And so we've been doing this for years, which is probably why we get these personal invitations. But I always feel a little bit guilty because I feel I'm transgressing on, on other people's territory. So I'd like to hear what your opinion is on that. Are those uh, federal pre-budget hearings? Both, both federal and provincial. Well, I know in British Columbia, uh, uh, we, um, our BC Council submits a brief to uh, our provincial government. Uh, but, we've not been invited to do anything for the federal government, but I think uh, that uh, uh, CFUW does submit in the spring, do they not? Catherine? We we, yeah, we do submit briefs and, and Marianne, I, I, I mean, it's probably a historic thing from something that you did many years ago, but really I think that, that CFUW should be sending a single brief from CFUW. Mm -hmm. mm, We'd be lovely to have you work federal. on it. <laughs> yeah, to the federal budget. And yeah, but usually a request know, for, you uh, have a re yeah, you have a, Sorry. I missed you. I couldn't hear because several people were speaking at the same time. Yeah. Anyway, you don't have to answer me now, but maybe you can give it some thought. I have cottage internet, which is like, mm, but what I was gonna say is that, that it would, that we should probably have one brief going from CFUW, but it would be really good for you to work on that with CFUW. So you have the contact, but if we send one brief from CFUW, that, that's the way it should go. That okay. it's probably a historic thing from work you did years ago. And the same provincially, I think, and Joyce just asked that question mm. about provincial briefs. There's nothing to stop provincial councils doing that. In fact, that's a very good thing for, for them to be doing. I think Ontario but always has. Again, it's that who does what. Right. I think so, yeah. yeah. So there's a, another question um, about how the, uh, who does what um, and how it will be circulated. Um, it is currently on the CFUW member site um, under the, the advocacy tab, and it's also um, been included, it may have just been buried in a few club action newsletters. Um, but uh, again, um, th there will be a, a newsletter going out this week, so I will be, um, I can include that again, just so you can have the, the link ready. And um, there uh, is a, f a few questions on the, the fall advocacy package. So um, this year, uh, as Jeanette has mentioned, there were eight resolutions that were adopted. And um, along with the resolution presenters and the advocacy committee, um, we created um, some backgrounders that include um, you know, quick facts and relevant legislation that clubs could use. Um, 
in uh, their, their advocacy asks, but we also included a, a template letter for each of the, the eight policies um, that uh, you know, club presidents can, can use uh, as, as, as a framework or just send the letter um, on the, the club letterhead as they see fit. Um, and those are also uh, available. That was sent out as a, as a standalone newsletter and it's also available right on the um, CFUW member uh, site um, under the, the advocacy uh, tab. So um, again, two emergency resolutions on um, long-term care. Uh, th there were really interesting resolutions this year, um, things about uh, cl climate change, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, protection for vulnerable communities. Um, again, really, really solid, great research that went into those proposals and into those resolutions. So I really um, urge you, I'll actually send a link right now, um, to, to take a look at that um, site and to take a look at all of the, um, you know, the, the backgrounders and how you can take action and uh, take a look at the template letter uh, as well. So I'll, I'll actually get that up right now and, and send, um, send a link to that. Because again, you know, with, with all the emails that go out, some important stuff d does tend to get buried. Um, so again, I will uh, pass that over in the chat. Just let me get the link up. And could I ask a question? Uh, there has been some uh, question about using the template letters uh, personally and mm -hmm. how to adjust them for that. Uh, have you uh, had any action on that, Charlotte? I, I think using the template letter and sending a personal letter, but not saying, I am writing on behalf of CFUW and just, you know, going straight into the, I am concerned about X, Y, Z, and this is, these are my proposals. I don't see any problem with that. Um, again, it's all working towards a similar goal. Say if it's on um, including long-term care under the Canada Health Act or taking action on climate change, I, I really don't see why um, just eliminating the I am writing on behalf of CFEW and sending as, as an individual. I mean, um, I send uh, letters all the time and I've actually just included uh, a few other organizations, uh, similar types of online letter writing or petitions that people can sign as an individual and not necessarily a CFEW member. So, so, so the template letters are in Word, so they can, uh, you can just delete those sections and add in uh, your own thoughts, right? Mm, exactly. So, uh, I think Grace had asked if there could be an example of a, of modifying a, uh, one of our template letters for personal use. But um, yeah, I believe just Harry? just just uh, you know deleting Maybe. that first because I yeah. think a lot of them just begin with I am writing on behalf of X Y Z. Some people change them and send it to MPs. Yeah, so it seems as though it's a common practice as well. Okay. Thank you. I think there's a question. She raised her hand. Uh, hi. Uh, thanks, Charlotte. Can we go back for a minute to this uh, business about uh, provincial briefs for provincial budgets? That seems to me a great opportunity to um, expand our footprint as an organization if mm -hmm. all provincial councils could uh, uh, submit a brief. But uh, we need to see some templates, see what's been done in the past, and have some supports around how to research it and so on. But that might be an idea. Yeah. I think that's a that, that's a great thing to pursue. So um, I believe it was Marianne who said uh, CFUW Burlington had long participated in those. So I wonder yeah. maybe if, if you would be able to send me if you have access to those files um, and we could look at what, what had um, been done in the past and adapt that to a provincial template. And I have, I think, copies of RBC. It might have been from a few years ago, but I can do that. I can send that to you. And I think Terry Shaw has some from Ontario for Ontario. Perfect. 
and I have poor Canadian geography skills because I have no idea what province Burlington is in. Ontario. Ontario? Okay. Perfect. Yeah, great, great question and, and a, totally a, a great way to expand. Maybe, maybe Kathy Wisnick would have access because she was an Ontario Council last year and uh, Ontario Council usually sends briefs. Kathy? Oh. Perfect. Uh, yeah, Isabel also is Ontario Council, so I think, uh, yeah, Terry Shaw would have all those letters for sure. I just popped my I think email. Terry's off. probably not. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think Terry's with us this evening. Um, are there, do we have any more questions or concerns? I have one, which is that I find with letter writing, we have sometimes had, like as an advocacy group, prepared a letter, made multiple copies, addressed envelopes, put stamps on them, and then handed them out at a general meeting. And people have been good and they've mailed them, but politicians are very aware of what you send them. And so when we got our responses, it would say, thank you for your form letter. So I think it is very, it's very important that you vary, even if you vary it slightly, especially the beginning of your letter, so that you don't fall into that trap of being kind of dumped in that category. Mm. That's when we met with our MP, that was one thing he said to us, if, if you can individualize it or, or make it meaningful to your community or you know your province and that it, it or it was our MPP we were meeting when, when that was going on he gave us some really helpful sort of uh, tips in terms of um, making it effective. I think the other thing too is if you're writing nationally and this was something that happened with the child care if you're writing nationally when you write to ministers, make it effective to that ministry. Like if you're writing to the federal uh, deputy, min deputy prime minister and the minister of finance, what's important for her is money and budgets. If you're writing to the ministry of seniors, what's important to them is seniors. If you're writing to the ministry of child care and somebody what's important to them is child care so customize your letters to the minister not a form letter to every minister that's looking the same mm -hmm. I, I think, think that, that was that was one of the successes for Catherine's letter to uh, the various ministers that she wrote to on child care during the during the prorogation is she wrote 17 letters and they were all somewhat customized to the various ministers. Uh, one really good way of doing that is reading the minister's mandate letter. Like yes. If you look, for example, at Minister Hassan's mandate letter, you will see that he has responsibilities in different areas. And you can incorporate in your letter each one of those different areas and that will, in his case, triple the appeal of that letter. Exactly. So I am thinking that these are very good suggestions that we should send out to all of the clubs. Uh, and, you know, how to, how to make your letter more effective. What do you think? The big success of that letter was the exact wording was used in the speech from the throne. Yeah. So uh, what we asked for in affordable, accessible, high quality was exact the phrase taken from the letter. I've never leapt up and down in excitement at a speech from the throne before, but yeah, <laughs> yes, somebody read it. Well, this one pr uh, promised us so many goodies that I followed it up immediately saying, well, wonderful throne speech, but how much money are you allocating to these uh, priorities of ours? Because unless the money's there, you know, the promises well, aren't worth the money. Next... Uh, Catherine, the but reason that's the next successful? bit is holding the government accountable. Sorry? The reason and it was successful? Sorry. 
The reason it was successful is because you sent it to 16 ministers with exactly that same captioned phrase. And so they heard it over and over and over again at the cabinet table. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have a much of a choice, but to, to echo it in the throne speech. And, and there were also other organizations who used that language, right? Like the, uh, the childhood coalition. So, and we've been at this for 50 years, you know, with that language. So it's nice and gratifying to see it there in the throne speech. <laughs> Well, you brought up another good thing, and, and uh, that is uh, partners, that uh, partnering with uh, other organizations uh, really adds to our impact as well. Mm -hmm. And I see, uh, yeah, Joy has uh, suggested a toolkit for communicating with government. I think that's a great idea to um, incorporate um, even, even just having a, a few pages specifically on, on letter writing. Um, and how to maximize impact. Yeah, I believe um, I'll probably just make this entire, um, you know, the, the recorded presentation, the, the slides, um, and the suggestions from the discussion. I could make that into uh, its own tab on the website and hopefully have um, all of our um, discussions just consolidated into one place. Mm -hmm. Sounds good. Oh, Joy has her hand raised. So I, I think one of the things that's really important uh, in the, the letter writing is, is the research. And so reading that mandate letter is the place to start uh, re, uh, looking at the language that other stakeholders are using or government reporting is using. All of that front end is really important in, in the successful actually uh, writing an impactful communication or whatever your communication strategy is, whether it's writing letters or however you're going to do it. Mm -hmm. So I, I would want to see that front research part uh, incorporated into how to write the letter. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, when so, we're um, Julie, advocating uh, on... Oh, pardon. No, it's what I was going to say. A lot of that research is what is in the background as right and, I was, and I was so in the that. and then the research that was what you're gonna say yeah that yeah there is the research there to back it up to use in the letter and i wanted to respond to marianne's comment about the throne speech the next piece now is making sure that all those promises are followed through on because there's going to be lots of opportunity there for advocacy i think Remembering too that we sent a letter praising them for the throne speech mm. and kind of reiterating, you know, the asks and thank you very much. And, you know, now we want to see it actually yeah. happen. We're listening and paying attention. And sending the same letters to the critics, to the yeah. opposition parties, because if they, if they yeah. sabotage this minority government before the throne speech promises are capped, then they've undone all the good work that we've started. And it wouldn't be the first time because you remember the NDP actually shafted the Liberals and called an election when we thought we were finally going to get our Universal Child Care National Program. Exactly. So, so keep them, keep their feet to the fire. But we're talking federal government and I'm wondering in the provincial government, are there mandate letters for the ministers there? And if there are, there, are they harder to find? Because I, I oh, wouldn't be at all surprised. Are they easy to, well, I in don't Ontario, know about Alberta. They're, they're absolutely simple to find in Ontario. Okay, I don't know about Alberta, Joy. <laughs> you could just try Googling them. Just go minister okay. such and such mandate letter. Okay, fair enough. Because <laughs> in Alberta, they don't seem to be responsible for everything. They just do. Anyway, just a political comment there. <laughs> we won't comment. We feel sorry for you, Heather. <laughs> All right. So um, do we have any more um, concerns we need to discuss or any more suggestions? Um, Date letters in BC, they're easy to access. Okay, so um, do we need to discuss anything else? Um, or 
does our does our pathway forward look like a a, a toolkit um, uh, a CFUW uh, just general advocacy toolkit? Mm-hmm. Uh, Joy had a question about uh, dollars. She said next we have to just discuss dollars. So she might want to speak about that. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, Cheryl, this has been really, really good and helpful. Thank you, uh, Jeanette, as well. Uh, and Catherine, I think any toolkit should be accompanied with an opportunity to discuss the contents. Uh, so it could just be brief. It can even be a half an hour to go over um, how you use the toolkit and you know whatever questions people have. So I think that that communication okay. piece added to the resource is really important. Um, and then um, just, you know, sometimes advocacy groups never talk about uh, how things are going to be funded. Mm -hmm. And so if we have any commentary on funding, I think we want to be part of the solution discussion as well as here's the problem. Politicians love to hear here's the solution. Definitely, and I think that's why where where partners come in, um, especially with uh, say childcare now, or I'm thinking of uh, the Canadian Network of Women Shelters. You know, it, to, you know they they probably did this research two three years ago and have everything laid out right. So I think um, rather than doing all of the work ourselves and duplicating it, right, um, look look for things that have already have already been done and things that are already happening. And, you know, showing them how much addressing any one of the social issues um, has a positive impact and saves them money. This is how you can save dollars mm -hmm. and grow your economy. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm becoming somewhat cynical um, in terms of uh, believing that governments do things because it's the moral and the right thing to do. And it feels like strengthening the argument with some economic factors mm -hmm. uh, tends to get more attention. But all our advocacy creates pressure. I mean, the, cham the Chamber of Commerce just came out asking for a basic income pilot project of the federal government. And I think if, if many people hadn't been advocated for basic income, for the past few years, that would never have occurred to the Chamber of Commerce. I think also COVID contributed to that as well. Yeah. I see Judy has her hand raised. Yes, thank you, Charlotte. Uh, I would be curious to do some research and find out how the province of Quebec has done <clears throat> with their, um, their child care program. Um, they've had it for quite a while, and it is affordable child care. We should look at their figures, their finances, and the the outcome of it, and what are the positives and the negatives. That that information is all there, and uh, it would be good to have that information when we are proposing this for the rest of the country. Somebody must have already done that research. Yeah, Marianne yes. has her hand up. Yes, actually, uh, we use that fact that for every dollar they invest, I think federally they get back a dollar four, and provincially forty three cents. And they've had it; they've had that program for twenty years now, and lots of solid research has been done. And there's no doubt that you know it's a net benefit uh, to the government as well. It saves the money. It is a cost at the beginning, I believe. I think that that. Uh, there was a, a, a bit of struggle financially when the program started, but once it got rolling, yes, it is. And the other thing that it has accomplished is that children who come from disadvantaged homes now are in better shape and have a better chance at academic success because they have had that preschool that they didn't have normally. Right, and there's lots of information available on this. It, it, uh, you know, we don't have to uh, so for that. So. No, 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 I'm sure it's available, but we certainly should use it. Yes, we do. Yeah. Um, so just uh, pause. Oh, Heather. Go ahead. 
one of the other things that I know Joy will, will be happy to hear me ask this question is, um, in the toolkit, one of the things that we should include is evaluating. Mm. Uh, we should figure out how to evaluate the effectiveness of our advocacy in some way, um, the time that we spend doing it, maybe, and um, the impact and outcomes from it. Mm. Outcomes. Yeah, outcomes. great suggestion. Perfect. Yeah. Charlotte, about, you know, we are monitoring the responses that we're getting when we're sending letters to the government. And that's one thing that we're tracking. Are we getting responses also? Um, you know, trying to set up meetings is another way of, of measuring if we're getting a response. But I just wanted to, to mention with the childcare now, I had a really interesting meeting with um, Mona Ballantyne from childcare now a couple of days ago. And she was saying that since the government made the announcement in the speech from the throne, the banks and the chambers of commerce are all suddenly expressing interest in childcare because it looks like there's going to be money there. Not only that, but the and, women... Uh, the it, women. It, and Go ahead. What I was going to say is they, they are... They're also pushing for meetings with the ministers and the minister's office, which is what we've been trying to do as well. So we were talking how it, about how it's important that, you know, what what they're looking and what she she was she used the comment that they're looking at the demand side and we have to look at the supply so you know they're looking at the demand and the where the money is and we need to know what the supply is of childcare. so so it was a really interesting discussion and i think you know when when money comes in we have lots of other people who are suddenly going to be advocating for issues Well, in terms of childcare, I remember that maybe 20 years ago, there was a push to have big companies have in-house nursery schools. And some of them tried it, but they gave it up because it was just too expensive. There's no money in childcare, you know, it's, it's gonna cost. The other thing that, that uh, is a real problem with uh, child care, at least in British Columbia, is that uh, the uh, child care employees are so poorly paid, you know, some of them even below minimum wage. Apparently, they can make more working as a barista in Starbucks than they can uh, working in child care, even though they've had to uh, have a course before they can uh, enter their profession. Yeah, and similarly with long-term care, again, you see that that undervaluation of, of the workers and then they're they're placed in a in a precarious position, right? And like like we've seen people are working at multiple multiple places just to patch together um, you know, a livable income. And that's where we see a lot of the problems. Um so just to uh, reiterate the um, who does what document, I just sent that in the chat, but it's also available on the um, member website. Um, just if you wanna take a look at that, I know my screen was maybe a little bit small, so um, unlimited zooming um, on the website available. And um, I'd just like to hopefully wrap things up. This has been a, a great discussion and we have, um, I've, I have, a lot of good notes as to um, how we're going to 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 move forward with um, a lot of the the things we've been talking about. Um, so, does anyone? Okay, we have a question from Heather. In resolutions, have we ever considered the idea of how to evaluate progress and outcomes if this resolution became policy? Yes, we have indeed. The thing about advocacy is that people tend to get discouraged because to change public opinion, it takes on average 20 years. So people want instant results. And so they have a resolution, they've advocated their hearts out, and next year the government hasn't implemented the policy. But these are long, slow processes. 
And so it's important not to expect immediate results. And, and what you need is persistence. You just have to keep pushing and pushing and pushing. Not, not to get discouraged if you don't get results in one or two years. Right. Well, uh, I see... Oh, Barbara has her hand raised. Oh, okay. Yes, I'd just like to encourage you to give any positive um, results that you're getting. You know, if somebody has responded, and I think members do need that encouragement, as was just mentioned, mm -hmm. that uh, we do like to see immediate response and to make an effort and then hear absolutely nothing. They think, what's the use? Right. So as much... Um, feedback that anybody is getting would be encouraged. And I'm just wondering, are the clubs sending mainly individual letters on behalf of the clubs or our uh, membership, are they really keen to, to write letters? I'm skeptical um, about the enthusiasm uh, about getting everybody to, to write their own letters. And uh, it would be so much easier, but I know it's not nearly as effective. You know, we want to bombard the, the minister or MP with as many as possible and to be as personal. And uh, you know, I talked to my MLA and he just says, oh, well, that's a form letter and just pushed it aside. You know, and uh, so if it is something that is by a constituent, and uh, he might, might respond. <laughs> right, uh, and Charlotte, um, there was a request from uh, a British Columbia member to uh, post the letters uh, that we received back from the, the ministry. Uh, is that a possibility? Yeah, so I'm, um, that's my task for tomorrow. Um, I have, uh, I'd like to create some type of uh, scorecard type of, um, you know, visual to see um, who we're sending letters to, who we're getting responses from, and who is just pushing us off to the to the side, right? So again, I think that goes back to Barbara's um, point on seeing encouragement of just who's actually responding, and right. if it's a if it's an elevated response of not just hey, hello, we've received your correspondence, thank you. Um, and yeah, I think, I think it's, it's quite important to, to see that, um, you know, the response and, uh, the follow-up. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, I'm keen to do that, uh, tomorrow or begin work on that tomorrow to post, you know, who, um, or, or what the, what the letter was on or what the issue is or the exact letter and then, um, the responses we've received. I think that's a great, um, way to, to keep spirits up. One way to encourage a, a response that's more than thank you very much is to incorporate a question in your letter, a question that would then need an answer. Mm. Very good. Right. Yeah. And I think um, just on Barbara's question on uh, the, the level of um, enthusiasm on writing letters, I think that's what, um, you know, uh, signaled that we can that to, to have this discussion because there was quite a lot of enthusiasm from members who wanted to to send and write letters to the prime minister to various ministers and that's where we got into the um the weeds of the who does what so um i think with uh the proposal to uh include for um you know, local issues, or if, if you're a CFEW club president or just a member um, writing an individual letter, CCing the, the ministers um, as opposed to just directly sending to the ministers. I think that um, will we'll keep, yeah, because we were, we were talking about how we don't want to stifle advocacy. And if, if, if members have enthusiasm, we want them to, to write the letters, right? So, um, I think the solution of, of having the CC um, will allow for that um, enthusiasm to, uh, you know, keep going. Um, but yeah, I think that, that that level of enthusiasm is actually what triggered us to, to have this discussion. Ever use media pressure? Janet, good question. Um, I wonder, I'm still quite new. So um, 
I don't know if a uh, someone who has been on for a bit or has ever used media in their advocacy ask would, would well we have we have had press releases on uh, a variety of issues I know I don't know if there's ever been uh, interviews uh, you know with uh, uh, news agencies and so on uh, but uh, it, I know that we have lots of social media now, Facebook and Instagram, and is there something else? Do we Twitter? Do we Twitter? We LinkedIn? We do all the things. Uh-huh. Um, yeah, and, and I'm also, uh, I love writing op-eds, so I hope to um, uh, use that uh, for, for national initiatives as well. Um, Elaine. Yes, a, may I yeah. just make a comment? Um, uh, another group that I'm involved with in an advocacy uh, committee. Um, now we're writing specific letters to municipal or provincial, um, but the last line of the letter or often the last line is, um, my vote depends on your answer. Mm. And we, uh. have, we have gotten responses much more quickly because they see at the last letter, at the last line is my vote. Oh my. Yeah. Good suggestion. Um, I'm just perusing the, the screens to see if anyone has their hands up. Okay, well, um, that was a, a great discussion and I really thank everyone for attending and um, again, these uh, materials will be available for your use um, and if you know someone who who didn't get the chance to hop on um, again we will have uh, all of these materials available so um, and uh, hopefully we will be creating that uh, toolkit with some with some consultation from from members to uh, really drive home um, our advocacy efforts there so um, I don't know if Jeanette or Catherine wants to have the, the final word. Final word? Uh, yes, I would like to have a final word and it is to thank you, Charlotte, for all the, the innovative work that you have done since joining us. Uh, there's lots of interest from uh, our members, I feel, uh, this fall, and I think your actions have uh, sparked a lot of that interest because you are putting things out that people can relate to. Uh, and uh, this webinar, for example, or town hall, pardon me, uh, is uh, a great example of the work that you've done for us. So thank you very much. Happy to do it. Thank you, Sheila. Okay, well, thank you so much, everyone. Um, uh, I'll, I'll be seeing you tomorrow. Hopefully I'm, I'm going to be sending a, a newsletter out either tomorrow or Friday. So look for that in your inboxes. Thank you, Charlotte. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Bye. Good night. Have a great night. Thank you. And everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.